Hello, DevOps. This is the modern Java web developer boot camp. I'm going to teach you all the skills that you need to know to be a modern Java web developer. To start off, my name is Matt Rabel. I'm a uh, hick from the sticks, as some of you know. Grew up in the backwoods of Montana, no electricity, no running water for 16 years. I had to walk two miles to the bus stop every day, and yes, it was uphill both ways. <laughs> I do have a strange addiction to Volkswagen buses, and uh, since this one's been in progress for almost 10 years, I bought another one that actually runs. So now I'd like to know a little bit more about you. How many people have developed a Struts 1 application? That's like 70%. Anyone done any PHP? That's about 30%. Anyone done Ruby on Rails? About 5%. Okay, and the reason I ask those questions is I believe that the Struts 1 was the killer app for Java EE, and it really brought it into the forefront of web development. And chances are, if you've developed a Struts 1 app, you've been doing it long, for a long time. So maybe there's some legacy information that you possess. And uh, I'll teach you some modern stuff. Has anyone written CSS from scratch? That's like 80%. Um, why do you hate JavaScript? <laughs> this side of the room, any volunteers? <laughs> What's that? Low it's a low level language? It's too high level of a language? <laughs> What's your favorite JavaScript framework? jQuery, Angular, way in the back. Did he say Dojo? Backbone. No one says Dojo anymore. And uh, I will give you the opportunity to express if you want to learn anything in particular from this talk. So if you want to shout it out or raise your hand, go ahead, but uh, you don't have to. So this topic was inspired by Ben and Martin's well-grounded Java developer. I read it about a year and a half ago, and it was very informative to me about all the things that I should know about Java development, including you know, how to do bytecode manipulation, how to read bytecode, how to develop with other languages, and basically everything kind of on the back end of Java development. And I thought to myself, I've done a lot of front-end development. Maybe I should do something similar for people that do the front-end. So that's my inspiration. The purpose is to actually teach you the skills that you might need to be a valuable front-end developer. What I found in my career, I started doing HTML and JavaScript and CSS way back when Netscape 1.0 came out in uh, the early 90s. And I found through my career that I ended up being a JavaScript or a Java developer on the back end a fair amount, and, uh, and then came back in 2006 and 2007 to doing a lot of front end development. And I've always found it very valuable in my career to know both the back end and the front end. And especially being a consultant, there's a lot of people that really like people that can do both. And so my goal here is to provide you with similar skills. So if there's anything that um, is related to a topic and we're going too fast through it and you'd like to learn more, please raise your hand and ask a question. Um, I'd love this to be a very interactive session where we have many, many discussions and, uh, and go that way. So the first thing that you need to do to be a modern Java web developer is use the JVM. And once you use the JVM, then you get access to all these tools like Grails and Play and HTML5 and JRuby and Scala. And then I believe there's a number of things that you need to do on top of that. I think you need to start with fast hardware. This is vitally important. Um, I think you need to use IntelliJ. How many people use Eclipse? It's like half the audience. How many people use NetBeans? It's about 10%. How many people use Eclipse because it's free? Really? That's like 30%. That's like the carpenter going down to the hardware store and being like, where's the free hammers? 
or could I get a free saw because, you know, I don't really want to pay for my tools. So if you're using Eclipse just because it's free, you should probably think about that. Um, I think you should leverage HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS3, create high-performance websites, um, develop for mobile devices. It's probably important for your company, and deploy it into the cloud or at least leverage the cloud for a lot of your deployments. You also need to care about security. And, uh, and this, I think, is becoming more and more important as there's more vulnerabilities discovered. As frameworks are getting more popular, there's people out there that try to get money to actually you know, not tell people that a framework has an exploit. Um, we've seen with Grails, we've seen with Play, we've seen with Spring MVC in the last couple of years, and I think there's just going to be more and more. And it's not because they haven't existed, it's because no one targeted them before because they weren't that popular. So now they're getting you know, more and more popular and people are starting to exploit them more. So for fast hardware, um, you can get some pretty nice machines nowadays, a uh, MacBook Pro or a, uh, a Dell XPS, and, uh, and the hardware is cheap too. You can get um, the memory for you know, 100 megs for 16 gigs. So I have 16 gigs in this laptop here. You can get a SSD now for you know, five or 600 bucks, which should be a day's wages. Um, if it's not a day's wages, then that's what we're trying to solve here. And, uh, and everything will be a lot faster. What I've discovered in my own situation was that the memory basically increases speed by double. And, uh, and the SSD increases speed by 10 times. So if you're using an old school non-SSD drive, I highly encourage you to get one. IntelliJ, for me it's a no-brainer, especially last year when it was 25 bucks for like two weeks right before Christmas. Um, I've used it for 10 years. The reason I really love IntelliJ is mostly because I consider myself a web developer more so than a Java developer. And the CSS and the JavaScript support is unmatched in other IDEs. Um, NetBeans has come a long way. Um, the, the latest version, 7.4, is, is certainly trying to be what you know, IntelliJ has been for a long time. Um, but there's, you know, it's, it's got the legacy of, of really good HTML support. Also supports Emmet, which used to be called Zen Coding, kind of like Zen Coding name better, but with Emmet. Um, you can basically type HTML in one line and hit tab, and it spits out all the HTML code you have in there. So Emmet is a project that's out there, Emmet.io, that you can get plugins for pretty much any text editor that exists and, uh, and write this kind of syntax in there. So if you find yourself you know, writing a lot of curly braces or not, liking the, the brackets, and go ahead and try Emmet for a while. I think the modern JVM web developer should also know Java 7 and 8. Um, strings and switch statements, I think, are uh, a nice addition. I haven't used them myself, but the diamond syntax, you write less code. If you're using IntelliJ, it's already doing it for you. It's basically hiding you know, the uh, annotation, or not the annotations, but the uh, generics on the right side and just allowing you to define them on the left. Um, try with resources, does all the closing of connections for you and other um, input streams. Um, improved in section, exception handling where you can have multi-catch and uh, a whole new NIO with uh, file, paths, and asynchronous IO. Um, and then there's Java 8, which is slated for, I think, March now. Um, it's supposed to be released in September, but Oracle seems to be very good at slipping dates. Um, there is a keynote tomorrow on Java 8 if you want to learn more about it. Um, but the, the biggest thing there is obviously lambdas and, uh, and the ability to write, you know, cleaner code and less boilerplate. Um, the date and time a API, I think, is a big help. Um, and the functional interfaces, that's what they did to, to make lambdas possible where, you know, interfaces can have a default method now. And then also the Nash on JavaScript engine is exciting. Like, we could be able to run things similar to Node on the JVM um, in parallel collections. And so with parallelism in Java 8, um, you get the stream API that allows you to basically operate on that. You can filter it, you can map it, um, you can get a max number from it. Um, to turn that into something that runs on multiple cores, all you need to do is change from stream to parallel stream. So that's pretty nice. The modern JVM web developer is also aware of spring data. Um, I like to think that it has the potential to be the new Hibernate. 
Um, Hibernate is still very popular as well as JPA. Um, I've seen a lot of people using the Hibernate implementation of JPA and it's basically an abstraction both on Hibernate and JPA and it allows you to use NoSQL databases. So if you're getting into NoSQL and you want to you know, use a tool that allows you to use more than one persistence engine then it works great for that. There's also Servlet 3. If you're not aware of this, you can write a web application without a web XML file. Um, web, server, web filter, web listener are all annotations that you can use. There's a web application listener that you can implement and basically do all the configuration of your app in Java code. And this is something personally that I'm going to try to do over the next year is to get rid of most of the XML in my projects just because it's cumbersome. If you're using Eclipse, it doesn't refactor well. IntelliJ is pretty good at it. Um, and asynchronous, um, reactive, you've heard about reactive, we'll talk a bit about, more about that in the next slide. Um, and then REST and functional programming are also things that are concepts that are, you know, important to the modern JVM developer. And with reactive applications, um, users basically can expect millisecond response times and 100% uptimes. At least this is what TypeSafe would like to tell you. Um, and the data needs are expanding into petabytes. So if you actually have this kind of situation, then good for you. Your company has succeeded. Um, but for a lot of people, you know, they don't have millions of users. And so it's just something to be aware of that if, if you want to build a system that allows you to be scalable and resilient and event-driven, um, there is tools out there to, to make this possible. And this is, you know, mostly a big push by TypeSafe, but a lot of other companies are, are jumping on board and using it. Um, the key building blocks, um, Netflix is using it a lot with their Rx Java project. Um, Akka allows you to do it in, in your projects as well. It's just observable models, event streams, and stateful clients. And by stateful clients, we mean instead of doing the traditional request response, they're more WebSocket driven or server side event driven where they actually have an open connection to the server and you're streaming data to them. And it was great. I have a project that I was working on two weeks ago where the client asked me for an architecture diagram of all the code that, uh, or, or how we would build our mobile app. And I found this play reactive application that um, someone had drawn up and had nice little diagrams and things that moved around and stuff. And it was the perfect like thing to copy and then send to a client and say, hey, this is how we should build our next generation. It's all reactive and stuff. And as you know, the VP of development, he gets something and here's a new term and he Googles it and finds out there's a whole manifesto about it. He's like, wow, yeah, that looks great. We've got to do it. Um, turns out there's no streaming API on our back end like there is for Twitter. So there's, there's not really a good reason to try to build, you know, that kind of architecture. But um, it is something that's out there and it is something that a lot of people are, are promoting and it can work if you have users like that. Um, I'm going to take a break here because one of the things that's going on with my setup is there's no speaker notes. So I'm going to try to fix that real quick. Does anyone use a new keynote and knows where it's at? I don't see it. We had to do this just to get the thing to play over there. So let's go with. Keynote 6, speaker notes. Slideshow menu. Kind of awkward, but at least I'm not running to the bathroom like I had to do in one presentation once. Maybe that one. No, then I get nothing. If you're a speaker at the conference, I'm helping you right now for when you encounter the same thing, hopefully. You think it's under there? Doesn't have anything to do with Keynote? Or it's still in, oh, well, let's see if I do here. This is a group effort. We'll all figure this out. These are skills that you can use. <laughs> I 
Uh uh. Uh uh. I can't, like, normally in Keynote you can drag stuff around, move like windows and stuff, and put your notes at the bottom. I have no idea how to find that. I do over here, yeah, but I don't see the notes at the bottom. Okay, so play it and then go. The show navigator. Mm. Yeah? There we go. Look at you. I would like to buy you a beer, my friend. <laughs> All right. So when we talk about asynchronous and we talk about Node on, on the JVM, um, one of the things that comes to mind is, is Avatar. Avatar was announced at Java 1. It was actually announced a year before Java 1, avatar.java.net. Um, it provides a JavaScript services layer zeroed in on supporting REST, WebSockets, and server sent events, and a rich client-side framework. Sounds great, doesn't it? In that same sentence, they end it with, that assumes very minor JavaScript knowledge. You're going to tell me I should write JavaScript applications on your fancy framework and not know the code that I'm writing? That's why we're here. We're here to learn JavaScript. We're here to learn CSS. We're here to learn HTML5 so you can know everything about the frameworks and the tools that you're developing with. Um, but the good news is if you want to learn more about it, there is a session on Friday at 11.50 in room 8 about avatar.js. So... Oracle's trying to get into the space. I respect it. I hope that we can get a good implementation of JavaScript working on the JVM. I just don't know if uh, we don't want to learn JavaScript after we get it working. So the other popular functional programming language that you can certainly look into is Scala. And I'm sure a lot of you saw Venkat's session this morning. Um, Scala is like the dragon in Avatar. It will try to kill you. But if you master it, you can fly great distances with it and have a wonderful time. And so Scala really makes the syntax of developing and coding on the JVM much simpler. It allows you to you know, eliminate your parentheses, get rid of a lot of your getters and setters, and, uh, and just makes it you know, a lot more fun. But it can be difficult. And personally, for me, I have a web developer background. I never knew anything about computer science. My degrees are in Russian international business and Java, or in uh, and, and finance. Finance was like, how do I make money? And then I found out that this whole computer science thing is pretty lucrative. So uh, I went into that. And, uh, and when I took a course on Scala and started learning Scala and functional programming, a lot of the principles behind it forced you to learn how to do tail recursion and all these computer science concepts. So if you're a web developer like me and you kind of you know, backdoored it in where you didn't have to learn computer science to do it, I think it's, it's great to learn it and get exposed to a lot of those concepts. If nothing else, just so you can talk to your peers a little more and, and sound a little more intelligent. Um, but the Scala basics are, you know, def starts a method. Um, you don't start it with a type um, or, or public or, you know, private or protected like we do in Java. Um, variables are started with var or val, and uh, var is mutable, val is not. Um, variables are defined with name, colon, type. Um, instead of type space name, um, no semicolons required. And, uh, and there is some interesting Scala code out there. So it's, uh, it kind of provides people to do crazy stuff, where in Java it's all, you know, it just ends up being that much code. With Scala it ends up being like three lines, but you really don't know how they work. Um, but <laughs> it does exist, and it, it is nice to use, um, especially when you have, you know, simple POJOs, for instance. Um, with Java, you know, you have a car and you have a couple variables and you have to have getters and setters for them. You have to pass them into the constructor. Same thing in Scala is just a simple car. And it gives you all the same functionality as that Java class. But if we're talking about Scala and we're talking about functional programming, what about Groovy? Not that kind of Groovy. Groovy the language. Groovy is still cool and Grails is awesome. Um, it just doesn't have the hype that Scala does right now. According to what I found, um, it's, uh, it's actually decreasing, and Scala is increasing. 
So this is from January of 2012, which is almost two years ago. And then if we look at January 2013, Groovy's actually gone down in popularity. These are job trends, so it's, you know, who's hiring for what. Um, Scala has gone up. Um, but then the crazy thing that I just found this morning, as of noon today, um, Scala just took a nosedive. I don't know what happened earlier in January, but um, Groovy's way up and Scala's way down. So those are just fun graphs. Um, and at DevOps even, Scala is down. Two sessions to three. So uh, that's interesting. So to learn Scala, I recommend Scala for the Impatient by Case Horseman. Um, it's a very good book for someone who just wants to sit down for a couple hours and learn most of the basics. Um, Programming in Scala, the second edition. Do you remember when I was here two years ago and I talked about you know Scala and Play and HTML5 and hooking all those together in a mobile app? Um, I was halfway through that book at that time. I'm still there. <laughs> Good book. Um, great reference. Um, doesn't read very well. Um, and then the thing I recommend the most, if you really want to learn Scala, and this, this helped me the most, is Functional Programming Principles in Scala from Coursera. Um, great course. It's about seven weeks long. It's going to be a lot harder than you expect. It's probably going to take a lot more homework hours than you expect. Um, they do say on the syllabus that it's going to be five to seven hours a week, and, and that's what it takes. Um, I always started the homework the night before, and when you start homework at eight o'clock at night, five to seven hours goes early into the morning. So be aware of that if you do take it. Um, the last one started in September, so obviously you're a little late for that, um, but they do do one or two per year, so you can certainly sign up for the next one. Um, there's also a reactive one that just got announced, and I think it started last week. Um, that same URL, but instead of prog fun, it's reactive on the end. And uh, I assume it's similarly hard and equally rewarding. But of course, Java is still a viable growing language. Um, it's still got you know, some of the most developers, um, still the most popular. Today, actually, you know, this was from February of earlier this year, but now C is on top. C and Java keep jumping back and forth on the TOB index. Um, Objective C is third, surprisingly. Um, but C++ is up there, and, uh, and JavaScript's in number 10. And uh, Transact SQL is number 9. Anyone using that? <laughs> Consider yourselves lucky. And this is all great, I think, if you want to be a services developer or an Android developer, right? Because, you know, knowing Java and using it, you can do it on a daily basis. Um, if you're going to be a services developer, I would suggest you learn REST and you start using REST in your projects. And you can easily document your API that you, you create with uh, a REST framework. Uh, Enunciate works great for that. Um, gives you the ability to, for your clients to actually download the code and, uh, and the, or the clients and see all the API methods. There's also uh, Swagger, um, which has annotations that you can use on your service classes and then publish the API in a nice HTML5 interface that people can see and use to talk to your API. A lot of times this will probably be internally, where you're just publishing to your front-end developers, um, but it could also be if you're a public company or you know, have APIs that you're publishing, a nice way to, to show that. Um, the good news is there's lots of frameworks to help you build your REST API quickly. Um, the three that I generally recommend are Grails, Play, and Drop Wizard. And Drop Wizard is a project from Yammer that basically allows you to create an application based on Jersey, based on Jetty, and based on Java that'll handle 15,000 to 20,000 connections per second. So their whole goal is REST API as fast as possible. And they include like metrics and other frameworks in there that allow you to monitor it and track it. Um, and every time I recommend this to clients, they end up saying, probably similar to what you're thinking, but what about Spring? We already have Spring MVC in there, and we can just build our REST API with that. Absolutely. Um, the thing that I struggle with with my clients is they actually want to use something new. And the reason they want to use something new and not Spring MVC is because, one, there's, you know, it's tough to get zero turnaround unless you use something like JRebel, um, and you know, Grails and Play allow you to not restart your app server. But two, they're trying to hire talented developers. And talented developers, when they hear Spring, they're like, meh, 
at least in Silicon Valley. But you tell them that they can use Grails or they can use Play or something like that or a new framework, then they're like, sweet, I want that job. So it's kind of a weird way of thinking about things, but that's how I've had a, a couple of clients behave. So if we compare you know, these REST API frameworks, um, some more fun graphs, um, we get an interesting number on dice.com. Um, and I assume this is just the US, I'm pretty sure. So Grails um, has a lot of people looking for Grails developers. Play, not so much. Jax RS, not so much. These all look pretty good numbers until you add Spring MVC in there, and then it's like everyone's hiring for Spring. Um, Drop Wizard has four jobs open. So I don't know if you want to learn that. Or maybe you do, because if there's four jobs, you could probably get a pretty good rate. Um, this, this baffles me. Um, LinkedIn skills. So this is just going on LinkedIn and being like, I'm going to search for a skill and see how many people have it in their profile. These numbers in the US are way different. I redid this graph um, when I got here yesterday. And, and this, I mean, if anyone knows why the numbers are different over here than in the US, I'm still searching the world. Um, but maybe LinkedIn's like, hey, you're coming from Belgium, so we'll give you a bunch more numbers. These are three times higher when I search here than when I search in the US. That's weird. So anyway, a um, bunch of people know Spring, a bunch of people know Grails. Um, Spring MVC is basically the new struts. So that can be good, that can be bad. Um, but there's, a, there's room for improvement is what it means because something better could probably come along. Um, and there's you know 5,000 people that know Play. Um, not a lot of people are admitting to Jax RS or, or knowing you know a spec. If I had done REST, it probably would have been a lot higher. Um, if you look at Google Trends, and the interest over time, Grails peaked in 2009, and uh, Spring MVC is still on its way up. Um, Play is still climbing, and uh, Jax RS and Drop Wizard aren't doing so well. So um, Drop Wizard, I think, is, is for hardcore people that have done this before and are just looking for a slimmed down solution to produce a REST API. And, uh, and you know, Grails is still a leader, as well as Spring MVC in producing those APIs. Um, with job trends, um, Play Framework is actually beating um, Grails in the absolute scale, so it's, it's gone up a lot. Um, and then the relative scale, um, Grails is still up there. You add Spring MVC in, the other ones look small. Mailing list traffic, Spring MVC doesn't publish theirs. Play is beating Grails, but both of them have a ton of traffic. And then Stack Overflow, um, Grails, ton of questions. Spring MVC has 35,000, so I didn't even bother to add it. And uh, if you want to learn more about Spring MVC and its REST support, there is a session on uh, Thursday, designing a RESTful API using Spring 4 at 4.40 uh, at PM, or 16.40, as you like to call it over here. But if you want to remain a web developer, you should learn all the latest and greatest browser technologies. But first, let's talk about the modern principles in web development. Develop a mobile app first, or basically develop your app for mobile first. And that's pretty easy to do, but it's hard to remember to do. How do you do that? You just squish down your browser, or you use like iOS simulator to actually test your app. So a lot of times, as developers, we'll always have you know, Chrome full screen on our big monitor. We'll be refreshing it. You know, we'll see how it looks. looks great but we never pull out our phone and look at it, or we never use a simulator, or we never squish down our browser. So developing mobile first takes, you know, squish down your browser, see what it looks like. And uh, I think it's a great way to develop software because it, it forces you to concentrate on the simple stuff. Whenever I've worked with clients that have this app that they want to make into a mobile web app, it's about removing features or hiding them. Well, if you don't have those to begin with, then, you know, with a desktop app, you can, you know, maybe add features or show those. And so it's a, it's a much simpler way to develop software. Develop single page applications. Create and use your own REST API. And sex sells. I think we've all known this, that if stuff looks good, people are happy. And that's why as being a front end developer, I've always enjoyed that role on projects because you're the guy that makes it look good. You're the guy where the demo people are like, nice work. The back end guys are like, Man, I did so much work, you're not even going to talk about it. So fast. No, nope, they always care about the front end. So let's talk a bit about, before we get into, you know, deep dive into the technologies, I'd like to talk about HTTP and the basic protocol 
that we use to transfer over the web. It's a request response protocol and it features Keep Alive HTTPS or HTTP Secure, can do binary, can do compression, and this will become important at the end when we talk about gzipping. Who gzips their web app right now? That's like 5 to 10 percent. We are going to make you guys heroes when you get back. Gzipping does so much for performance, it's amazing. Um, and then HTTP methods um, with 1.0, which came out in 1990, um, they just had get, post, and head. And then it's, it's hard to believe, but 99 is when they added options, put, delete, trace, and connect. And uh, the only ones that are really safe are uh, head, get, options, and trace because they don't change anything, they don't manipulate anything. And I've even seen libraries like jQuery will send an options request when they're trying to do you know, certain operations to see if it's available on the server. And the server can send headers back that says, yes, you can do it. Um, put and delete you know, can actually change data. Or actually, an item potent request, um, multiple identical requests should have the same effect as a single request. Post, you know, don't use that unless you only want to do it once, because uh, chances are it'll have different side effects. Um, and then the insecure ones, and these are actually used by more and more hackers, is a trace, track, and debug. So make sure you have those turned off. Uh, most app servers have them turned off by default, but um, if it's a full-blown HTTP server, it could have those available. And requests and responses are, are pretty similar, or pretty simple. Um, back here you can see there's a client request. Um, it's got a get, it's got a location, and it's got the protocol that it wants to use and the host it came from. And, uh, and then the server response you know, has similar information, the protocol, the status code, and a name. So you got HTTP 1.1, 200, OK, date, server, and all this kind of stuff. And this is why, the reason I'm telling you this is because you can examine all this information with browser tools. And a lot of times it's very important to understand it, to understand when you're having issues communicating with one server to another. And if you look at the response headers and you look at the request headers between one system and another, a lot of times you can determine the problem. For instance, I had a situation a month ago where we were developing an application that uses HTTP client from Apache Commons and talks to a .NET server to do graphing. And so what it does is it talks to the server, retrieves you know, an image, comes back and shows it to the user. And um, there was all this session information where we were taking the cookies from ASP.NET and, uh, and you know, putting them in our header and then you know, sending them back so we could share the session. And, uh, and what I noticed was the host that was being sent wasn't the host that it expected. And, uh, and just by manipulating you know, that host header, I was able to get it to communicate better. So um, if you can read those HTTP headers and, and be aware of how HTTP works, um, chances are it'll help you a lot as a web developer. The thing that's, that's going to happen in the next couple of years that will likely change our lives and make things better is Speedy um, from Google. And uh, it's actually become the basis of HTTP 2.0. So it allows client and servers to compress request and response headers. Um, so that means you know, less bandwidth, faster. Um, allows multiple simultaneous multiplex requests over a single connection. So again, faster. Um, and allows the server to actually push resources to the client that it knows the client will need. So one of the things that we talked about at dinner last night was the next thing after reactive applications is proactive applications. Like they actually know what you want. So they'll start sending it ahead of time. They know what you're going to click on. So um, Speedy actually allows you to do that. And uh, April 2014 is the last call for HTTP 2.0. And November of next year um, is when they're going to submit it to the IESG for consideration as a proposed standard. So there's a lot of plugins for it right now. You can use it with Apache, you can use it with Nginx, and you can you know, start using it um, if you want faster applications right now. Of course, um, you have older browsers that might not support it, but if you're using mobile browsers or you're using some of the latest and greatest, then I would suggest to take a look at it. There is a session tonight on it. There's a BOF from 7 to 8 on HTTP 2.0, Speedy, and Jetty. Um, so if you are interested in that, you could go learn about it this evening. 
So the modern Java web developer leverages HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS. And it's been a long ways to get to HTML5. We started with HTML in 1991, HTML2 in 1994. I don't know if anyone even used that. 96, there was CSS and JavaScript. That's when I started delving into it. Um, and then, you know, it really became fun, I think, in 2005 when Ajax, you know, kind of had a resurgence. And now with HTML5, it's become fun again and, uh, and more so because now we have browser tools. And if you've ever worked with IE7 and its lack of browser tools, what a pain in the ass. How many people have to support IE7 on their projects? That's good. It's like 20%. What about IE8? Same 20%. Poor guys. Um, yeah, I have to support it all the time, too. And the only way that I've found to get around it is just to tell people it's going to cost twice as much. And if you're already on an existing project, the project has already begun, and you, know, you tell them that you know, we shouldn't support IE7, that's going to be tough. But what I've found is the next project, usually they'll, they'll try to you know, suppress support for it or, or not support for it. So Firebug was awesome when it first came out. It really revolutionized, I think, web development. And now with Chrome Developer Tools, they're doing crazy stuff where you don't even need an editor anymore. You can do all your development right in Chrome. And uh, the elements in the console and the ability to you know, write JavaScript code in the console, um, the ability to manipulate all your settings, the ability to use page speed and you know, see what you're changing is, uh, is invaluable. But the reason I like it the most, but the reason I like it the most, I'll show you. I use it for a lot of my presentations. So this is my wife's website. She said I could do this as long as none of you steal her photos and use them for commercial purposes. So if I was to go into one of her portfolios here and look at a Colorado picture and try to grab it, it says this is not available. So I do Option Command I, and I go in here, and I click on it there. And then I grab it right here. And then I can save it. <laughs> so nice use of Chrome Developer Tools. I actually use this a fair amount. If I've ever had forms where you know, I don't want to give them information and they're doing client-side validation for banking or something like that, I'll go in there and just remove like, the required element or manipulate the JavaScript. <laughs> so real nice. For so real nice for that. So now that you have a better understanding of what you can do with Chrome Developers Tools, um, let's look at the hottest technology, HTML5. Um, it has all kinds of features that you might find useful. For instance, video um, and audio. You don't have to use Flash for those anymore, which is Obviously, um, used to be something that was kind of an option, but if you want to do mobile devices, you don't really have a choice. Um, there's also 3D and WebGL. Um, there's games that you can develop with Canvas, um, and Canvas is a super powerful API, and uh, it's you know really nice once you get to know it. Um, but <laughs> it is difficult to learn, um, and and you know you can download fonts. You can have good-looking websites. You can wait for the fonts to download now. And, uh, and there's all kinds of storage you can do. Before, all we had you know, was really Flash and cookies and stuff. And now there's all kinds of um, new APIs you can use. So how do you write HTML5? How many know? I just told you. That was supposed to be the next slide. Um, you just put a doc type in there, and then you can say that you have an HTML5 app. So um, the nice thing is if you do that, um, there's some IE apps that will break. So that's a good way of, of getting you know, around supporting IE. Um, but there's a whole bunch of new tags that come with it, um, article aside, section, header footer. Um, and a lot of these you can use right now. You might have to use a shim or something like that to give it a block display. Um, but for the most part, you can use them in, in any older browser. Um, they did remove applet. So JavaFX is going to have a tough time. Um, but FX is for the desktop, not for the web. Um, center and font are out, which is nice. But these browsers still have to support all those to be backwards compatible. So it's just not in the spec anymore, but it's still supported by all the browsers. Frame and frame set are out. Um, iframe was out for a while, but I don't think that worked. So they're leaving that in there. And then, you know, the biggest thing that I've seen in my projects is using the HTML5 form elements. 
um, for getting validation and, and adding placeholders. And I've had really good success in actually using placeholders in projects and then um, people not finding that it doesn't work in IE7. So it's one of those things that, you know, it doesn't work in IE7, but you can add a polyfill and, and it will work. So I encourage you to start using these now. You can have autofocus, you can have required, and the browser will handle, you know, making sure people fill in those fields. Dive into html5.info slash forums has more information on that. Um, also, you know, type equals email, and it'll validate that there's an at sign and a period in it. Um, and there's 13 new field types. There's email, URL, number, range. There's even date and date time. So you could have, on some browsers, a calendar that pops up. Um, and all of this web development's easy if there's only one browser, right? And so that's why mobile development's so much fun, because then you only have to support, like, one or two browsers, and they're always the latest. Um, but if you're able to support just Chrome or just IE 11, which came out last week, keep that job and uh, start using month, week, and time, and search, and color, and, uh, and having, you know, those native components within the browser. HTML5 also defines a number of other killer features like local storage, um, like I mentioned, Canvas, a little-known one called Post Message that you can use to communicate between browser windows, um, and geolocation which is useful on mobile apps. Um, not so much on browser apps, but certainly on mobile apps. Um, Core HTML5 Canvas is one of the best JavaScript books I've ever read. If you want to do game development, or you want to learn some hardcore Java API stuff, um, David Geary's book is excellent. Um, and there's also WebSockets, which is becoming more and more popular pending browser support. Um, but Socket.io handles it all for you with legacy browsers. So if you want to do WebSockets, I'd take a look at Socket.io and, uh, and start, you know, using it that way. There was a great story published last week about comparing a REST API with uh, a WebSockets API, and they were basically just doing echo commands. Um, but I think they found that the, the performance on WebSockets was five times faster than a REST API. So um, if you're having issues with the performance of your REST API, you could certainly look into WebSockets. And so let's dive a little deeper into HTML5 storage because I think it's a useful thing that people aren't using as much as they could. There's basically a number of different APIs that are out there. There's the web storage APIs, local storage, and session storage. And those are just options or objects that are available um, via JavaScript. That's their names. Um, there's web SQL database. There's index DB. There's an application cache that you can use to basically put your application offline and cache all the files in your application on the browser. And then there's a, a number of file APIs. And before HTML5, you know, you used cookies, flash storage. IE had a user data thing that I never used, but apparently you could use. Um, Google Gears, Dojo Storage. So there was, there was options. But the beauty of these is that um, they're built into the browsers. You can reduce your network requests. You can get a lot faster performance. Um, with window.local storage, and you can just use local storage, you don't have to do window. Um, it's a simple key value store. Um, it's persistent through page load, so it's similar to cookies. Um, it's great for storing user preferences because you don't really need to send that information back to the server, or maybe you do it at the end of the session, um, and avoids the HTTP overhead of cookies. So it's just the basic API is set item and get item, and it stores strings. There's also you can do length if you want to see how many items are in there. There's a, you can refer to them key and then a, an integer, you know, 0, 1, 2 to get a certain key out. Um, you can also remove items. That's another API method. And then clear if you want to remove everything. Um, session storage is the same as local storage, um, but it lasts for the whole browser session. Um, but interestingly, it creates a new session when you do a new window or a new tab. So it's just, you know, for that browser window. Um, great for sensitive data because you're never sending anything to the server. You're just trying to store, you know, that information for that user. Um, excellent use case, I think, is text areas, right, that don't save the data. Um, you could easily, you know, trap one at key up or something like that and just save it in there. And then if the person browser crashes or comes back, then it'll still be there. Um, like I said, it only stores strings. So if you want to store objects, um, you can just use JSON and uh, store as JSON objects and use the native JSON, like JSON.stringify or JSON parse, and, uh, you know, get the objects that way. The other storage APIs are the WebSQL database, um, which is a client-side database, asynchronous, 
and synchronous, um, and it was a wrapper around SQLite um, supported by Chrome, Safari, and Opera. So Firefox and IE were like, nah, we don't want to do that. So that one's kind of died. Um, it's no longer maintained as a spec. Um, IndexedDB is the best of local storage and session storage and web SQL, um, but it's not supported by IE9 or iOS or Safari. So if you want to use those browsers in there, but it is supported by IE10 and IE11. Um, and then the application cache is, is usually mostly used for mobile apps where you want to download basically everything so you know people can operate it on the client. I think PhoneGap has kind of taken over in that role lately, but it is used by the iPhone and Android Gmail app, so they do cache everything locally and then just make requests to the server for the data. Um, and then they do that because the native browser caching is unreliable. People can clear their cache and, and stuff like that. Um, it is supported by IE10+, plus, but it's not supported by IE9. So to look at browser support for local storage, it's across the board. They don't have IE7 on here, so if you have to support IE7, they'll maybe use cookies or something like that. But everywhere else, you can use it, so you could start using it now. So if you are using cookies, to do like you know small storage between different pages, I would encourage you to look at local storage to do that instead. There's a number of new things in CSS3 that allow you to do things and make things look better versus before you had to use images to do it. Um, there's animated transitions, which Angular now in their latest version, they're using CSS a lot more than JavaScript to move things around. And so you can flip things, you can you know, transition things, you can fade things in and out, all with CSS now. You can do rounded corners, you can do drop shadows, you can do gradient colors, and yes, this was so great. And then the flat design came out, so much for rounded corners, huh? But the reason that flat is better is, is because of mobile. So rounded corners, gradients, were the biggest performance hits on mobile web apps. And so what they found is Bootstrap 3 is mobile first, and it's, uh, it's you know, designed to be a flat design by default, and uh, it's 100% faster than Bootstrap 2. So by getting rid of those, you know, rounded corners and gradients, um, just remember that if you want these things, you know, they're, they're cool, but they, they're expensive to render. Um, you can do styling based on sibling count, which is new. Um, the nth child. Is a, is a great element to use. You can do all kinds of calculations with it and you know, do zebra, zebra stripes on a table or, or other things that only do you know, every other one or um, different rows. Um, more cursors for better usability, so they added like 10 new cursors. Um, there's also custom checkboxes and radio buttons, so you can actually customize those and not use the native ones that come with the browser. And there's, uh, there's a few other secrets on that link there. The biggest thing, though, to me is, is the media queries, the ability to say, hey, on a smartphone or on an iPad or even on a TV or a big monitor, stretch things out or compact things and hide things. And, uh, and that's what people are doing a lot now is just detecting a mobile browser and squishing things down and, and hiding certain elements on the page. So if you add you know, the viewport tag into your website and you go and squish things down, you have a mobile web app, you have a responsive app, and you know, your, your boss got his money's worth for this conference. Um, but if you develop mobile first, then chances are you'll be doing it the other way around where you say, hey, if you've got a big monitor, then go ahead and show this part instead of you know, hiding it by default. So I certainly encourage you to um, develop mobile first and kind of start with smaller code and less code and then expand to bigger. And so just to show you some things that are possible with HTML5, this... Uh, CMI SCM site I'm going to take a look at here. So this is kind of showing that, you know, Flash can do some stuff, but we can do some pretty cool stuff too. You can pick them up. <laughs> if you're having trouble sleeping, you can play with the sheep. It's good for people with jet lag here. Um, typography.
There's no flash here. This is just HTML5, right? And words. And you'll notice it responds to the mouse too. So yeah, mostly games. I mean, I don't know when you'd use this in a banking app or anything like that, right? <laughs> but maybe the flip clock. I've actually had a client that was dead set on getting a flip clock into their app. And so this was one that I looked at. And the problem with this whole thing is it's based on images, and they're all this big. So there was, I think at the time, maybe they fixed it. There was no, like, responsiveness. Yeah. <laughs> so... I was like, well, we got to make a bunch of new images if you want to use that, but um, it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. So I encourage you to look at that site if you, you just want to show people that, you know, think Flash is better, um, what you can do with HTML5. And now I'd like to talk a bit about JavaScript, and particularly the good parts. Um, JavaScript already has lambdas in it. Do you know how you spell lambdas in JavaScript? Anyone? Function. It's a good nerd joke. Um, <laughs> dynamic objects, you just add a property to an object or remove it. Um, there's no reason to, you know, have classes or create a similar object or extend an object. Loose typing. Um, and, uh, well, there's some bad parts too. How about everything equals zero? Have you seen the graph that shows like the different ways of expressing zero in JavaScript? It's like zero and null, false, like all these different things. So um, the the good parts are uh, are nice, um, but the bad parts can be ugly, and uh, you just got to know when to stay away from them. The the thing that I recommend is using strict mode. So if you put use strict at the top of your JavaScript files, you see this in a lot of Angular code. Um, it's a new feature in ECMAScript 5 that allows you to place a program or a function in strict operation. So it doesn't do a lot of those bad JavaScript things. There's also native JSON parsers in most browsers. So you can do JSON parse or JSON stringify, and it converts you know, objects to string and strings to objects. And so one of the you know, biggest changes for me as I became a Java programmer and then you know, got back into JavaScript in 2004 and 2005 was, uh, was all the programming patterns and the, the ways that these big companies are developing their JavaScript. It's not just functions everywhere and included on every page and you know, downloading it for every page. It's, uh, it's basically all these different kinds of patterns. So the old school way is the functions, right? You just have a bunch of functions um, in a link or in a form. You call those functions with a JavaScript colon function name. Um, but then there's a whole new way of doing things where you have patterns that expose certain methods or certain variables. Um, and, and one of my favorite ones is the revealing module pattern. And so what the revealing module does is it basically has you know, a variable where you declare your program. And then within that program, you have you know, basically the ability to have private variables and private functions. And then you expose them at the end. So if you look here with return, set name, greeting, and get name, that's how it exposes you know, the ability to get that other information there. So what this allows you to do a lot of times is actually namespace your JavaScript and, uh, and have the ability to, you know, you could even put package names in there. Instead of my revealing module, you could have com company, you know, project or whatnot. And, uh, and then you can call it down below like it does there. And one of the first technologies you're going to want to do if you're doing JavaScript is jQuery. And that's just because, well, everyone's doing it. And, uh, and it makes JavaScript a lot easier. For, for a long time, it was you know, the ability to do the cross-browser stuff. Um, but now, you know, the browsers have gotten so much better. Um, it's still used by 68% of the top 10,000 sites out there, and 60% of the top 100,000. Um, fast, concise library, um, great for DOM manipulation, traversing HTML, and, uh, and adding AJAX interactions to a page. So, um, that's, you know, one of the first things they can do is just start using jQuery. Um, for, you know, websites that are built with jQuery, um, it's got the dominating one, and the rest of them are all Facebook like buttons, um, where people include Facebook. So 23% of sites are built with jQuery, and 
you know, a bunch of people are using Facebook and Twitter as well. So the easiest way to use jQuery in your page is just point at the CDN, and uh, you don't even have to download the JavaScript file. Um, Document Ready allows you to basically say, hey, when the page loads, go ahead and, and make these changes to the behavior. We've actually used that a ton on my current project. It's ugly, I'm not proud of it, um, to change how a page looks after it's loaded. And that's because it's coming from a server that's got all this HTML that's invalid. And so we strip out invalid HTML, we, we move things around and, and stuff like that, and we do that all in document ready. Um, there used to be, I forget the old API, but, but now, oh, it was live. Dot .live, is anyone using dot .live in their projects on jQuery? If you are, you're supposed to remove it. Um, now it's dot on is the new API that is much more performant. Um, you specify what event you want to listen for, click or whatever, um, the selector and then the function that you want to execute. Um, and the reason that you would use something like that versus document dot click is because if you add new elements to the page, it will actually listen for those and add the behavior to them. Um, and jQuery UI is, a, or was I should say, very popular for doing a lot of UI widget stuff. And the interesting thing for me is being a Java developer, you know, in the early 2000s, um, all these frameworks like JSF and Tapestry and, and Wicket basically said, you know, we need to, you need to do your components on the server. And I think a lot of that discussion ended in, uh, in the late 2000 aughts, is that what you call them? Um, where, you know, there was these JavaScript frameworks that would do it for you, so you didn't need as many components on the server. Um, and then Ajax is obviously great for doing XHR requests. Um, and div load is nice, or you know, any element dot load for pulling in other data into a certain part of your page. And Sizzle is a pure JavaScript CSS selector engine um, that jQuery uses that's really fast, and it's actually been dropped into a number of other libraries. So it's not just specific to jQuery. If you need to you know, have the ability to grab other things, you can certainly do that. And then CoffeeScript is a great language for actually getting rid of the bad parts of JavaScript. And what it does is it compiles into JavaScript. And this little website, JS2Coffee, will allow you to copy all your existing JavaScript into it, and then you have CoffeeScript. So that's the easy way to do it, but um, instead of function, you have arrows. Um, it's all based on spacing, so if you like Python, you might like it. Um, it basically makes all the good parts mandatory. Um, and if you're going to compile it to JavaScript, um, you could also use GWT, right, instead of CoffeeScript. But I've seen a lot of people use CoffeeScript in their projects and, and be happy with it. Um, I typically use JavaScript because I'm a consultant, and it's hard to convince, you know, companies to use five different technologies instead of just one. So um, the last thing I'd like to look at before we go on break here is, uh, is AngularJS. And uh, it's a JavaScript MVW framework. It's from Google, MIT license. It sounds like a few people in the crowd are using it. Um, the biggest feature that people like over using raw jQuery is, uh, is its data binding. And the fact that once you have a JavaScript object, you can show it on the page. And if you manipulate it on the page, then it actually changes it um, in the back end. And you can send it back to the server. And you don't have to do any binding of your own to change that value. Um, it's got localization components. It's very testable. I think for Java developers, it makes a lot of sense because they advocate putting certain things in certain files. Um, so it's similar to a lot of the Java patterns we have. And, uh, and you can use Angular Seed to start it. Um, great documentation and community. So the basics are ng app specifies where your app is. And then you include the JavaScript. And then you have a model that specifies what your values are. And you can see the template there looks like handlebars where it says, hello, your name, which manipulates and, and shows that page. Um, there's also a number of other JavaScript frameworks. Obviously, there's Backbone, there's Knockout, and there's, uh, there's Ember, JS. Um, and choosing a JavaScript MVC framework, I could probably do similar to the comparing JVM frameworks that talk like that. Um, but Adi Osmani has done all the work for us. So he's written an article, Journey Through the JavaScript MVC Jungle, that explains them all, how they work. And then he's talked about JavaScript design patterns, how you do that, like revealing module stuff. And he's developed this to-do MVC framework that implements, I think, 20 different MVC frameworks for JavaScript in the same application. So if you want to see how you do it in Angular versus how you do it in Ember, 
you can go to that site, download the projects, or look at the source code. Um, or you can just use Angular. Seems easier, right? This is uh, Ben Nattel's roller coaster journey through the world of Angular. Um, hates it, loves it, hates it, loves it. And then, uh, you know, awesomest framework ever. So my AngularJS experience, I've done two projects with it this year. Um, in January, I started a project where we wrote this dashboard, and I wrote four articles on that on my blog. So if you want to look at the nitty-gritty details, they're out there. And we basically got all our data from the server side as JSON, and then we constructed this UI, and we allowed them to drag and drop their, uh, these things. So you can drag this one down here. You can drag this one over here. You can click on them. It pops up and allows you to manipulate data inside them. These things are the same thing where you can drag them right to left. Um, you can also click the Show More button and see more, and then there's all this graphing down here. And then to communicate back to the server, we use DWR. And DWR was great for that. Um, it worked. We didn't have to use any you know, stuff that existed in Angular. We could have, but um, I didn't want to fight that battle. I just said, hey, we have DWR. Let's use that. And then in June of this year, I did a project for a client where we used Grails as a back end um, that talked to LDAP. And then I developed a front end in Angular that was kind of a dashboard application, not like this, but more of like a traditional web application. And the reason I did it in Angular was because there was a lot of fighting internally about what the back end might be. They wanted me to help them consolidate their portals. They had 50 portals. And when I started talking to them about what a portal was, it turns out a portal is a website. They just call them portals. And uh, so it was you know, a new web app that had all that data in there. And, uh, and they were deployed on either LifeRay or they were deployed on what's the Microsoft solution for portals? SharePoint. And so by doing it in Angular, I was saying that, hey, you can deploy it on anything you want. This is just a client. If you develop these REST endpoints, then you know, I can talk to those. So this is a deep dive into AngularJS. I have to get a few things set up here. So we've been going for an hour. Would you like to go for 20 more minutes, or would you like to take a break now? We got one for break. Raise a hand. Break now. 20 more minutes. 20 more minutes it is. OK, well, this is pretty good. It's intense coding. If I can find my mouse. There it is. Well, that's not quite full screen, is it? Come on, where's the bottom? All right, well, that's not going to work, is it? OK, let me out. Full screen on the browser. Presentation mode, where's that? Oh, wrong one. So close. Mm, still not quite there. Well, the good news is it's an MP4. I was just trying to be fancy with HTML5 and show a video that way. So let's try opening up the old-fashioned way. Then it'll scale properly. OK. Maybe. Presenter mode. All right, looks scaled properly. OK? So I'm going to start by creating a new application with Angular Seed. So first of all, you got to go download it, grab the GitHub URL, clone it. We called it one view since it was consolidating all 50 views. And then I usually create a new project in IntelliJ, because I like IntelliJ. It works great for JavaScript. IntelliJ works great for JavaScript. All 
I could pretend like I'm coding the whole time. And then if we open up the index.html file, that's the main file in your application, you can see there's an ng app. There's also an ng view that shows the pages. And the app version is an example of a directive. Then we have app.js, that's where you configure your Angular app. The route provider is where you configure, you know, when a certain URL goes to what controller or what view. Simple MVC. And then the partials, those basically pages that load within that ng view. And the interpolate is an example of a filter where it'll actually take, take your data, filter out, and replace it with something else. And then you can see here, app version, the directives are named kind of funny. Um, if you have a dash in it, then you uppercase the next word. So app dash version becomes app version, capital V. And I'm going to create a node configuration, since Angular C comes with a web server. And I can just run node from within IntelliJ. And you'll see the example app. Partial one, partial two. Then I'll go ahead and show that simple example that we saw earlier, the basics of Angular where, you know, we have a field that we can manipulate. So a name, an input. If you eliminate type equals text there, it doesn't work. Discovered that the hard way. It still shows on the page, but it doesn't do any binding. So then you have your ng model, which is name, and then you show it, you know, on the next line. So we can hey, say hello to Fergus. Love that name. And then what I'm going to do is build out a wireframe for our application now. So I'm going to change it to one view. I removed ng route, and that's because I'm actually going to use an older version of Angular. This was uh, the 1.2 version that I downloaded from Angular Seed. So we're building the travel port dashboard. Going to put a base href in there. Build out the head. And then we're going to create the app CSS. And then the header, which shows all a bunch of tabs at the top, as well as a account button on the right. And I'm going to grab all the images I need for the app. If only you could get them this fast from the UI team. Um, and then, you know, that's what it looks like. But we need to implement the tabs controller now. So if you see here, let me pause this for a bit. There's a number of, of Angular elements that, that I've been clicking on. One is that ng show there at the top for the user logged in. That's what determines whether it actually shows that section or not. And the ng click is, is to log out. And then this nav bar here is basically bootstrap that, you know, has all the tabs and, and allows you to, to see those. And then the ng click sets the selected tab. And those call methods in Angular. So now I'm going to go and grab the old version of Angular, paste it into my project. Angular 107. I'm going to add a new route for the tabs controller. First I'm going to create the tabs controller and you'll see here this is why I think it's it's familiar for Java developers is that profile get user is a service that we got dependency injected into the class. So you see there at the top, the root scope, scope, HTTP, location, those are all things that exist with Angular. If it has a dollar sign in front of it, it's part of the default Angular bundle. If it doesn't have it in there, then, you know, it's a service we create. So we have, you know, that profile get user. We have our tabs that we show across the top of the screen. And then we also define whether the user is logged in or not. So false by default. And then we'll go implement that profile service. You start with factory, and then again, dependency injection, you can pass things in. We have this get user method, and we're going to get profile slash show JSON. And if that data that comes back has a username in it, 
We're going to log it, and then we'll go ahead and broadcast that event and set the user at the root scope to what we got back from that service. So go back to our controller. We can listen for that event, root scope on. We set the user to logged in. And then we use this to set the tabs that are selected based on the URL that comes in. And then we set the selected tab. And then we set the tab class to active or not active. And then we implement the logout. So you see here, this logout is just a variable that we set on a scope. And then on our page, any functions that we set on the scope, we can actually call directly from the page. So this just calls the logout link, and then based on success or not, sets the logged in user. Now we're going to implement a, a mock profile service. By that, I mean show JSON is going to be just a file that I put in the project. So that's a nice thing about developing these kind of apps is you don't actually have to have the server side until you actually post data or need to you know, change data on the server. Now if we look at the demo, it's got our picture over here. All right, the guy's showing up. Um, but things still aren't right. Tabs don't work. Look at developer tools. Why is that happening? Oh, Angular's not defined. Huh. Well, that happened when I went and copied the new Angular in there um, because it only has the minified version. Change that. Go back. Boom, it works. So now we're getting those tabs that we defined to show up up here in the header, but they still don't look right. They don't look like we want them to. Well, that's because we don't have bootstrap in the project. So we'll go back to our index.html page, add in bootstrap from CDN, add in Fawn Awesome, which we're using some of their icons, and now it works like we expect it to. And you can see when you click on those tabs, it selects you know, the various tabs, and it changes the URL above. So if you refresh the page or do any back and forward stuff, that all works. Now we're going to build a new controller for the home screen. Oh, what I'm, what I'm showing you here is, is on the last screen that account drop down, nothing happened, so I had to add the bootstrap JS in. So I got to go grab it. Then you can see, you click on it and you see you know, those drop downs. So now I want to implement the home page that basically just you know, shows um, some reports information. So we had a route provider for home. There's a view slash home and a home controller. We have to create the, the home.html under our views directory. Obviously, you can put it anywhere you want. And then there's this links object, ng model, that we need to populate. Those are just links that we're going to show on the left side. Um, it's bootstrap tooltip. And we have some roles down below that we use to show and hide um, certain information. So we have for agent, we show one thing. For an owner, we show another. Obviously, a lot of times you'll probably want to do that on the server, but this worked great for a quick prototype. And then we're going to implement the home controller. And you'll see we have a new service called Portalpedia. And that has all the links. So we'll go ahead and create a new factory for Portalpedia. We're also going to get our reports information. And we're going to grab a role for that. That tells us what role the user's in. And we'll listen to when the user logged in in case we want to grab the user's information. So again, we need to implement a couple mock services. These are JSON that we go and grab. Reports just has the role in it. And the list is a list of links that we display on the left side.
and we clicked on home and it failed to render. Anyone that's done Angular know why? So anyone that doesn't, this will this might trip you up a bit, and if you remember this part, you'll be so thankful. Um, there's no ng view in there. So you need a div tag or some tag with an ng view that says, hey, here's where we want to, you to render it. So of course I go into developer tools, like why didn't that work? There's no information there. Huh. And then I remembered, oh, I need the ng view tag. Go into index.html. That's all you need. Boom, it works. But it's not centered, so I'm going to wrap a container around it from Bootstrap. And then there's also an ng cloak that you can use where it doesn't show the template or the HTML until after the page is rendered. So now you can see it's centered properly. It's got our links on the left side. It's got our different views on the right based on the person. And then I'll add ng-cloak in there so there's no flash of like unstyled data. I'll add a footer in there just because they want you to know about their privacy policy and you know, all the trademarks and stuff. Now I'm going to implement the uh, training and support tab. So that is a tags controller I use for that. I look for tags in the URL, and then I show the data for that tag according to that. So you can see that's where the URL comes from. And then we need a support.html. See, I can write HTML fast. The sites is a directive that processes and turns the data and the tag into code or into HTML. So the tags controller grabs a tag from the URL. You can see in our app that's where we define the controller. And then it uses a get on site tag and then the tag name and goes ahead and sets the sites accordingly. So we'll create a new directive called sites. We're restricted to an element versus like an attribute. And then what compile does is it takes the HTML that we had, which is just you know a simple one-liner, and converts it into all this. So it's almost like you know a tag library for Java developers where you can have your HTML become something different. Now we'll grab our fake data, training and support JSON. And then we'll demo it. And you can see there it works. All right, we got the links that get rendered below. And that's where the JSON looks like. Now we're going to implement the My Account feature which basically allows to update your profile information and uh, update your password. So there's nothing there right now. So we have to create a new route for profile.html. We have to go create a profile.html file. And we're going to comment out this avatar that shows the person's picture that allows them to click on it and replace it with a file upload. And we'll get to that in a bit. Um, this contact open, you can see ng show, um, is used to basically say that, hey, if this variable is true, then go ahead and show it. If it's not, then don't show it. And you can see we have variables in here that are bound to our data for the user. And we have ng click that opens. Um, forms so they can edit the information. We display it by default and then they can go ahead and edit. We also have these fields and anyone that's used Grails you'll probably find these familiar. It's familiar to the, it's similar to the fields tag where you basically write a one-liner for your input fields and then it transforms that into you know multiple lines with bootstraps classes wrapped around it. 
And then down here at the bottom, it's you know, opening the password form and manipulating the password. So now if we refresh, go to that page, you can see what it looks like. We don't have any data in there. We haven't created our controller, um, but it you know, shows it basically the structure of it. So we have a profile controller that we'll go and create. And you can see here we have a flash service. This is similar to the flash scope in certain frameworks. And we need a service for that. So we'll go ahead and define it. We're using the toaster library that shows messages up in the right corner. So this is you know, similar to how in Java you'd say, hey, when the route changes, go ahead and clear the queue so we don't have any messages showing up. And then this is just the API. It's similar to the revealing module pattern where it sets, gets, and pops the message. Um, and then Toaster handles displaying it. Toaster is a JavaScript library with CSS as well. So we're grabbing Toaster, putting it in our project. It's just a CSS S file and a JS file. And then we'll go ahead and implement our scope open and scope close. So those are two functions that we can call. We can pass in contact or we can pass in password and then it sets those variables either you know open password or open um, contact, displays those forms, sets them accordingly. You can see how it looks there, it just passes in the name. And it just sets a variable and that automatically shows and hides things. And then we can use scope watch to watch for changes in those variables. And if there's a new value, then what this does is it actually copies the user object that's just been manipulated into a contact object and then uses that contact to send back to the server um, for an update. And then this is just to get the regions for the drop down. I got to go implement that mock service. And then this update method we're calling from our form. You can see there's an ng submit update contact. And so we call update and profile just we update that service, calls the back end, closes the uh, section and then pops a message. So we need to implement that in our profile service. And this is how it normally look, HTTP post, you get back the response, and you set the root scope and you return the callback. But since we don't have a real back end, um, we're going to go ahead and comment that out and just fake it. Whatever you set it to, we'll give you back a response and call your callback. So you can see, now it renders the actual data from the user. And we can click, but there's nothing else shown. So the reason for that is we still need to implement that fields directive, right, that shows all those fields. So there's no warning, um, but if you viewed source on the page, you would see that there's field in there and it hasn't been transformed. So if we add a fields directive, we're restricting it to an element and we're compiling it again. So we're taking whatever data is given to us in static form of that HTML page and then writing out a label, an input field, a div around it, and any validation messages. So then we refresh, click update. Now you can see it's got that information populated in there. Same with password. Now if we try to update, it says please fill out this field. It's got the required validation in there. And then I update and there's no flash message, right? There's supposed to be a flash message that pops up. So what's going on here? Nothing from the console. The life of an HTML developer. Oh, we forgot to add toaster. So we go to add the CSS. We add the JavaScript at the bottom. 
reload, manipulate the data. And then when we click update, we get the message up there. So now we're going to implement the avatar and showing the image and allowing you to upload and replace an image. So it has an ng include that's similar to like a JSP include that you include other files with. Be created under a profile directory, so create the avatar.html. And this uses jQuery's file upload. Since jQuery UI has a file upload, um, this modal is actually from Angular Bootstrap. And ng-click uses the same logic to show or hide. Um, but then the modal pops up, and we have to use Angular Bootstrap and add it in for that. So again, we have an avatar controller. We'll go and create that. It uses a profile service and the flash service. Has the open and close methods. We also have some options for the uh, modal that we use from UI Bootstrap. And when the file upload is added, we broadcast that, hey, the profile event's changed. Pop a success message. When you remove the object, we do something similar. So we can basically remove the uh, image from anywhere on the page. Broadcast it to our other controllers. So now if we refresh, oh, we're missing some images. So that's because the service we're calling is profile slash photo. And that's just a relic from Grails um, because the Grails, the back end was originally Grails. So if we go in here and change that to our fake service, photo.jpg, and go ahead and refresh, then we get the right one. And But we're still seeing everything in there. So that's because we haven't added um, UI Bootstrap into our project. And so first of all, you need to add the uh, HTML files, but you also need to declare it for Angular to load the module. And once you do that, it's hidden. You don't see it. You click on it, you pop up. But we still see a browse button. That's because we don't have the jQuery UI CSS files. So then you got to go add those. Now if we refresh, it sees like we expect it to. So I'm not going to upload anything here because obviously the back end is not quite there. Um, and you can see my confirmed password behavior. I allow them to you know, see the password that they change it to. So this right here is, uh, is from BlueImp, jQuery file upload. It, they've converted it to an Angular component. Um, these are all the JavaScript files you need to add into your page to do the fancy things that this plugin does. Um, so I'm just adding those in, even though I'm not you know, showing you how it works. And at the bottom there, you can see there's a file upload Angular JS file. And then I also need to go in and add it as a module. And there's a whole bunch of code that I copied and pasted from Stack Overflow to make Angular JS's HTTP service behave like jQuery's. So I just saved you like an hour of uh, file upload time if you're dealing with Angular um, and jQuery UI. And then I also had to disable, um, they do some image resizing on the browser before it actually uploads it, um, but it doesn't work in Android or Opera. So this code right here goes ahead and says, hey, for Android and Opera, don't try to do the image resizing. And then I added in um, Google Analytics. So that was one of my client requirements. They wanted Google Analytics to track this application. And there's a, there's a plugin for Angular called AngularTix. And uh, they have, if you need to do analytics, they have a few different plugins for different services. One of them is Google Analytics. So I added that in there. I added the script at the bottom. We deployed it to CloudBees. And then I had to add it as the modules here. Kind of like Maven dependencies in a way, but it's JavaScript files. Reload the page. Ooh, file upload provider is not defined. So I had to go in and add that to my config. Add to the function, then you define it as a string as well, as a name. And then that solves that problem. And everything still works. 
So I made this on uh, Friday afternoon. And, uh, and as I was making it, I noticed that Angular 1.2 was released. So I was like, well, let's try to upload or upgrade and see how it works. So I'll go ahead and download 1.2. Copy it into my project. Change the reference. We're not in the Angular directory. We're in Angular 1.2. Everything else is separate, so it's just the one file. And refresh. And boom. Blows up. Does anyone know why? OK, good. You're learning. Um, in Angular 1.2, the routing has been moved to a separate module. So you have to load a second um, routing file, and you have to declare it as a dependency. So up at the top, you have ng-route. We deleted this in the beginning, but now we have to add it back in. And then at the bottom of our page, we have to add another reference to that route file. So there's, there's a number of services that come with Angular that you might have to do this for. Another one is its sanitized service. So if you need to do any escaping of HTML or anything on the client, it's a similar pattern where you go ahead and you add it to your app's configuration, and then at the bottom of the page or wherever you are, you, you know, add another JS file reference. And they're all included with the download. So now that we have that, boom, it's working. But now the problem is if I click on training and support, it doesn't work. This one took me a good bit to figure out. Um, the only thing I could think of was maybe the plus sign was causing something weird. So I went ahead into the app.js where it configures the URLs, and I said, well, let's escape it. And that turned out to be good enough. So then I was able to click on training and support. It pulls up the right page. The last thing was in the change password form. I had the ability to you know, show passwords when you clicked on that. That stopped working. Um, there was JavaScript at the bottom of the page that was I expected to be executed, and with partials, it's no longer executed, so I had to add it into the main page. And so it would be, you know, executed or done when the page load, and then I changed it to, you know, look for that when it came through using the on API. And then it worked. So that's, uh, that. So that's, uh, that's how I built a real-world project that a client paid for to, uh, with Angular and kind of you know, made it look similar to how a normal desktop app might look with pages in, in you know, different sections. So we'll go ahead and take a break now. Um, it's, uh, it's 15.07. We'll come back at like 15.35. So you've got a half hour to grab some coffee and do what you need to do.